Pick six with Molly and Haw starts now. What did you make of Michael Kopech's second straight laudable start? He went seven innings, two hits, one walk, nine Ks. Can you believe he's the first ever Sox pitcher with consecutive starts with seven innings, no runs, nine Ks, and two or fewer hits? I think when you when you become the first player to do something, it it, it kind of underscores how how good you were. And I think that um, I think it was Chris Kompka who came up with that. They just had it during the game, but then. Later, I saw in the post game that they credited him for that, so I want to make sure we do that. Um, yeah, it's because someone looked that up. Uh, here's the deal. I, I was in the car a little bit earlier, had a run an errand, and I heard uh, the broadcast, and they were talking about, um, I think it was DJ saying that that uh, Michael Kopech, is, he doesn't even know how good he should be or how good he can be. How many starts has Michael Kopech had? He His career has been interrupted a couple of different times and he opted out at, at COVID season, which is fine. And then he was in the bullpen. I think that when you look at him and his age and where he's at right now, um, he's not had very many starts. He's he's had 43 starts, something like that. 44, is it? I, I, I looked at it yesterday. At any rate, it's just not as many as you'd expect. Uh, 43, okay. So it's not as many as you would expect from a guy at that point in his career. But he looked, he has looked like the guy you trade for Chris Sale the last two times out. Now, you know, they pushed him back two days, I think, or a day, and he had a great performance. Um, But you combine these two starts, I, I think it's really exciting. I think he's finally putting it together, and man, you need it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would hate to say he's here, right? Because then I'd be disappointed at his, at his next start, if that's the case. Exactly. But I do love the fact that he's only had one walk in his last two starts, right? Because then then you you then you then take one uh, step over to look at the Ks, and he's had 19 strikeouts in those. So one, 19 strikeouts, one walk. For me, it lets me know you're in a groove. You're in a space, especially for how he was performing, you know, before that couldn't get past four and two thirds, you know, three starts ago. Obviously, that was against the Astros. But I think for me, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head, Muddy, like, He's gone through so many iterations of what a career is. And now where he's at right now, you know, you you do get that level of comfort when you're on the mound eventually, kind of like Dylan Cease, kind of like Giolito, where you say to yourself, well, damn, I I, I am of a certain age. I'm 27. I am a good pitching prospect. I should be doing I should be doing this uh, because I do believe in myself. So I agree with DJ and saying that, you know, he really has zero idea of how good he should be. But, man, the White Sox can only hope he can find some consistency so that that way he can be who we want him to be. Well, the White Sox were brilliant to do what they did in moving him back. It it worked out very well for everybody involved, especially Michael Kopech and then, of course, the White Sox. Gabe, great point about the one walk. That's huge. I don't care care who you are. That's been his boogeyman. Right, and especially, Mully, the stat that you pointed out, courtesy of Kampka, but still – the fact that he went as long as he did in these games and only had one walk. That, that, that's excellent. And, and for a Cubs fan, I've always been a Michael Kopech guy. I've been overvaluing this guy for years to the point that I've been made fun of about how much support I have given him. And I, He's I'm, dreamy. Come on. I'm thrilled. Did I'm you, thrilled for him. He looks, see, he's, he's, he's really exciting to watch. He's a guy that, like, you should tune in and watch regardless of your allegiance in this town. Like he's worth, he's box office to me. Like I like watching him pitch because of, because of the strikeout numbers and how he delivers the ball. They asked Sebi Zavala, you know, I think uh, he talked to Stoney and Jason at the end of the game. And, and Sebi is a man of few words. He's, he didn't have like long answers, but they asked him like about the number of fastballs. And he said, like, and he said, well, they can't hit it. (laughs) <laughs> I think basically, the ki- people can't hit his fastball. That was unbelievable. Well, if I start making your guys money, I can answer these questions. That's the voice of David Ross. What was your reaction when you saw the Cubs lineup yesterday? Do you feel you can predict success or failure when you see it? Have you become a lineup Easter as this team has struggled in the last month? You know, it's funny. I was listening uh, to you, Dustin, the other day and saying, like, what is he doing? Because Smiley's out there. All of a sudden, that's a victory. It's supposed to be what it is. And I, and I think that's how I felt yesterday when I was like, okay, Stroman's on the bump. I'm like, this lineup looks like a disaster. And I was like, but, I mean, you know, you just kind of feel like 
he has confidence in these guys. He had it last year towards the end of the season, just kind of making some makeshift lineups. Rossi did. And, and yeah, I mean, is it, is it is it frustrating because you want to be winning in that space? Yes. Is it frustrating seeing, you know, uh, you know, T Tauschman in there, seeing you know S Tucker Barnhart in there. Like, yeah, that that's stuff's frustrating as well. But when you get the victory, you know, you kind of tip your cap to Rossi and you say, well, damn, I guess you, you know, you, you felt you felt good about this lineup and and, and Tauschman came through in a couple clutch spots. So I felt like, uh, yes, it sucks. The lineup is, is was a disaster, like a holy T-shirt in the <laughs> summer. But you know, you got to you got to tip your cap again to Rossi for getting the dub. Well, I appreciate that I have this forum to give my opinions out because I do not uh, participate in social media other than to retweet and like things uh, through the Mully and Haw account. But I was fired up. Uh, left David alone since he's uh, celebrating a long weekend, but I did have to. I couldn't resist. I had to send Mully a note via our text string and say, what is he doing? I sent my guy Crawley a note, and I said, this is like a Sunday getaway day lineup. What is he doing? But, but... Forget about the lineup. So Megan Montemero, I think, does a really nice job she, on, on social media. She's a great follow. If you're a Cubs fan, you should you should be following her. So she had this from Ross. On the decision to put Mastroboni second in the order, Ross said he wanted to break up a top-heavy right-handed hitting lineup with Bellinger's sideline, wanted to give a different look and more speed. Okay, I'm still calling you-know-what on that. Yeah. But what does the pitcher do? Stroman. He induces ground balls. And I did say the other day that Stroman, you know, with him on the mound, those ground balls coming. Master Boney did a nice job at second base the other day. Mm -hmm. He did a nice job at third base last night. Like wisdom in that spot, not a good not not that would not have been good. So he could have sold me on the fact that he was in there for defense. But batting second and the opportunity to get five <laughs> plate appearances, you still can't sell me on that. Christopher Morell should be up there. Then they had the base. They had two guys on, nobody out, top of the order, out, 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 including Master Boney. And that could have ended up biting everybody in the backside. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, this question is born of Dustin's tweet, or his text, <laughs> rather, and his, you know, we do we do all keep in touch as the games are going on. And um, and Dustin's really become a lineup Easter. He really is looking at it that way. I think that... What's happened for me with the Cubs and not as much with the White Sox is I trust that there's a reason they're doing what they're doing. I, I have become, um, you know, really since Theo showed up, so much more trusting of the decisions they're making because when I see something like that, I think, well, there must be some number. They must have crunched some number that tells them that this guy has so many at-bats against that pitcher or on whatever a uh, a wednesday uh in the in the middle of uh of may he's likely to hit some there will be some reason for what they do and because i believe that i don't get as triggered but i understand I, when you look at that lineup and you look at the two hole and the catcher change and you, you know you just you're like what in the heck is that like you do not understand, but I think my trust in them is such that I will give them the benefit of the doubt, much more so than you, does. It is a really fascinating question. What did you make of Javier Assad being recalled from Iowa to take the place of Nick Birdie, who was put on the IL after going an appendectomy yesterday morning? Is it a coincidence that Aloy Jimenez recently had an appendectomy? And what is with the rash of appendectomies in Chicago baseball? Yeah, I, I don't know that I'd ever really heard of an appendectomy in baseball. I'm sure there have been plenty of them, but it wasn't even on my radar. And we had just been talking um, about Birdie. We had talked to uh, Tommy Hadovy about him. And, you know, local guy made good. I love the local stories. And he had a brother who was with the Sox for a minute before he got hurt and is still in the league, and that's good. You know, you like the local guys. But I got to tell you, when I saw that that he was going down with the appendectomy, I'm, I, it did cross my mind. Like, what the hell? Like, I really, I don't think I I knew that that was a, like an ongoing entity for people at, at that age, right? I mean, Aloy was very serious, right? He was like bent bad. over and head, you know, and still not back. And so I think it's just a bummer because... Nick Birdie's been through a lot to get to this point. He's back in the hometown. 
you know, the, I just read a story about all of his, uh, what's going on with him and how tough it's been. And, geez, here we go, epidectomy. It's just sad. I mean, it just interrupts the guy's career. Another thing. Now, minor thing, nothing like blowing out a, an arm or anything. But, good God, that was just a weird one. Yeah, tough. I mean, uh, you know, you look at Clint Frazier last year, had an appendectomy as well uh, when he was with the Cubs. And now he's so with, there is now he's with the Sox and something like that. I've actually had an appendectomy Have you before. Really? When? Yeah. How old were you? I was probably like 27, 28. Really? Yeah. So you're right in the wheelhouse. Well, because so what happened to me was I went up to Michigan. Uh, I was going to Michigan State, actually. And I, I thought I was going to have a nice medium burger. And it was undercooked a little bit. And so whatever bacteria gets into your system, oh, is that right? it wow. goes over to the other side and causes that, that. And let me tell you something. There is no pain. Like that. Like an appendectomy pain. Yeah. And I remember driving back from Michigan and having it the pain come every, like, minute, minute and a half to the point where you're like, this isn't this isn't right. And it's kind of similar to what the Eloy story came out. And then you go, and once you're pointing to that point of your stomach, they know immediately that it's a, it's, it's an appendectomy. Really? And the hope is that the, so like the right, lower right side? Lower left side. Lower left side. Lo- lower left side. And so, I mean, it sucks, right, to, to be in that position. Wow. But, but again, it, it has to do with, like, what you're eating. So is that right? It's a it's food. It's a bacteria. Based. It's Did a bacteria kind of thing that kind of seeps over to that side. Wow. So I mean, listen, I, I'm a I do like Javier Assad. I'm glad that he's back. But you're right, it does suck. You know that that Purdy uh, Birdie was just you know in that space. You know, trying to perform well for the Cubs. But I can't believe that people were trying to rush Eloy back so so quickly. You know, because yeah. they were talking about other people that have come back. And, and I just thought to myself, I, I think back to me being in the hospital bed over at Cook County. Wow. And being like, what the. <laughs> I'm never going to get out of this bed. So, yeah. uh, you know, kudos to the, to that's, the staff. That's and, one of the, the things they were actually saying with Aloy, that he had felt so bad when he had it that they were worried that him saying, oh, I feel great, I'm ready to go, was you feel comparatively great. Yeah, right, compared to, right, because that, that pain is, again, it's uh, it's paralyzing. Yeah, the story caught me off guard, that's for sure, and it is odd that we've got two guys, but I feel... You wanted to sod up when we were in the parking lot yesterday. Didn't right. You, didn't you bring that up? I did. Yeah. Um, but not in place of. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Um, not because not not for that reason. It's weird. Everybody heals differently. Gabe, thank you for sharing. You know your personal experience with yeah. that. I know my wife had one when she was a kid. Yeah. Um, I don't know anybody else really that's had yeah, that happen. Gone. But um, it just stinks for him because of the 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 story, right? And the Molly, you mentioned local guy made good that part of it. So you feel bad. The guy came in, he got his opportunity, was hitting over 100. That hadn't happened since 2016 for a Cubs pitcher. And then all of a sudden, he takes a couple steps backwards. So you hope that uh, he can get back. Um, but I am curious to see how they use Assad now that he's up here. Because everybody's pretty much asking the same question. That's Coach Dave Wanstead. How did you react to Justin Fields' evaluation of Chase Claypool's improvement during the offseason? Was it a compliment when he said... Races improved tremendously just from last year the end of last year to now that's one thing I'm, I'm truly proud to say just you know seeing his work ethic his attitude change um you can just see he's he's taking a, another step do you agree with that and do you agree with coach Wanstead's assessment of the Chase Claypool situation yeah I gotta be honest I mean I think you know I, I, I try to look at the age of the two of them right and I'm thinking to myself how, how are you able to make that assessment without feeling a certain type of way because you're younger than him and you just don't because you're the you're the, the natural leader of the Chicago Bears. And I think that, you know, Chase Claypool, I, I say this often, you either need a pat on the back or a kick in the butt in order to get the best out of a particular individual. Mm-hmm. And I think Chase Claypool just needs a pat on the back. And I think that Justin Fields was able to assess that last year. And, you know, you can't c- come down on the guy and give him that kick in the butt. So I think praising him early is just more so a way to have everyone buy into what Justin Fields is trying to trying to create there. He understands that there's only one football, and a lot of people are going to be feeling a certain type of way about maybe not getting as many targets because, let's be honest, Justin Fields has had a couple weapons that he can target, but he hasn't, so he spreads the ball around. So maybe he's just, you know, uh, playing a PR game there. But, geez, I mean, what else did we want to hear about Chase Claypool? We want That's what we wanted to hear, that he's, you know, his, his attitude's better, that he's, you know, he's, he's improved tremendously. His route running is getting better. So that that way, you know, Chase can feel like, oh, my quarterback has confidence to to get the ball and, and throw it to me because Chase isn't going to create a lot of space. The way he is going to get a lot of targets is, you know, being available for Justin Fields. So, uh, listen, I'm all for, you know, everybody being on the same page. And I, I, I would love to have heard what Chase Claypool had to say back about a guy like Justin Fields. Well, the beginning of the cut, you think, okay, this is just talking. 
right? But then he doubles down and so much better of last year to now. Like, that's the part where it's like, wow. So what? So did he come in with a bad attitude? Could he not pick no, up the I think playbook? That's, I think it's a playbook more so than an attitude thing. Like, he's so much better. He's so much in tune. He's so much more locked in. I hope you're, I hope you're right. Now, it's what's that's my funny fan, is, that's is that's that fan of me saying that, Dustin. <laughs> Chase Claypool and Cole Komet were a big argument on this show when they were getting drafted. And if I remember it correctly, Mully, you wanted the Bears to draft Chase Claypool right out of Notre Dame, and David and I wanted them to draft was that, was that, Cole Komet. Was that who it was? I was believe so. Claypool? But it's interesting. But, and he had a really good year. Oh, Early on, he yeah. was great, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just interesting that both guys are now here. Yeah, that's interesting. And both guys, I think, are in a big year. I think both guys need to show something. Komet was a little bit better, but he's still, like, really slow, in my opinion. Um, needs to do a lot. And we're going to talk about tight ends a little bit more this morning. So, good. Listen, it's now or never. That that's what Coach Wants that said yesterday or Tuesday. It's now or never. So yeah, that's that. that that's what, big. That is what Dave said, and he's right. Um, you know, I I think you could take. I think he meant this as a compliment, and I think that he was trying to say, "Wow, you wouldn't believe how good Chase is going to be this year." And he's, you know, talking about the guys. He broke down a couple different players. At any rate, um, what was interesting to me is if you turn these words around. Chase has improved tremendously just from the end of last year to now. Um, so Chase was useless when he came here last year. <laughs> that is one thing I'm truly proud to say. I was ashamed for him with the way he played last year. <laughs> just seeing his work ethic, his attitude change. That guy was a dead arse who didn't even want to be here. You could just see he's taken another step. I didn't think he'd ever get any better. I love this I Mad mean, Libs. Going. I, I know, but I'm going. I'm just turning it around. So yeah. if you wanted to, you could take it like, wow. I think he meant it in a very positive way, and what he said was very positive. <laughs> but there's also the implication that the guy, you know, what? Like, why did we bring that guy in? Uh, but it, great. I hope it proves to be the case because it is now or never. I mean, yeah. I feel like I answered this question uh, earlier. Were you at all intrigued when hearing Justin Fields describing the guys with what he had to say about tight end Robert Tunyon, local guy made good, now two years removed from an ACL? Of course, Rob, you know, came from this offense, so he's already experienced with this, and he's a great uh, route runner, natural pass catcher, so it's great to have him. Fields suggested Tunyon and Cole Komet will learn from each other, but is Tunyon's status as a former Packer making something of a secret weapon for Luke Getze? You know, maybe we have underestimated, you know, Robert Tunyon had like a really good year with uh, Aaron Rodgers, and then he blew his knee out. Now, Tunyon is a, I believe, undrafted free agent, started in Detroit, came out of Indiana State. Local guy made good, as we mentioned, so you're for him. But I think that he's on a one-year deal, right? It's not like they've they've signed him as a long-term solution. But here's a guy that knows the offense, that has been in the offense, that understands the terminology that knows where you're supposed to go his problem had been physically coming back from that injury and now a couple years removed from an acl this guy is this guy has got good speed he can catch the ball down the field he, he might be he might be somebody that you're going to see more of than you think and i i like the idea that that he had i like Kmet a lot i think cole Kmet. Local guy made good, just got his degree. Come on. He had to go back and go to classes. <laughs> Justin Fields said yesterday, eh, it was all on Zoom. <laughs> but uh, but he was just downplaying his accomplishment. I, I I like another weapon and maybe one we haven't talked enough about, and hopefully we'll see something from him if indeed he's as good as you uh, as you hear the quarterback imply. Yeah, I think Robert Tunyon's going to be a better compliment to Cole Komet than like a Jimmy Graham, where, you know, he's like, everybody's just staring at him only. I think having a two tight end set is going to be awesome. You're going to be able to maybe take one of them wide and, and really do some things with the Bears offense. So that's going to be good. Uh, when you're talking about durability, I mean, you know, three out of his five seasons, he's played at least 16 games. So, you know, that says a lot about him. And then in 2020, he, uh, Robert Tunyon did have 11 touchdowns. So I remember yeah. him being a nuisance for the Chicago Bears. Listen. I'm all here for the good story about Cole Komet and, yes, Chicago guy, you know, local guy made good, all that good stuff. But, you know, I just need way more from, from Cole Komet, yes. right? Not even just a little bit. I need I need way more from Cole Komet. Way I mean, more before you pay him? 
Yeah, way more before I pay him. Way more, more before I call him a, 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 the, the best tight end on the team, right? Like, I look at a guy like Robert Tunyon, and I think to myself, Tunyon thinks he's the best tight end on the squad. And I think he's out there to prove it. And if he's a good route runner, if he has good hands, you know, Justin Fields is a guy that once he trusts you, he will give you the ball. And so, you know, we saw that in like a small four-game window for Cole Komet last year uh, when he was putting up his touchdowns in that one little space. But, you know, you need consistency. And I want to root for Cole Komet more than I do in the present. And I just I, I want him to be better than Robert Tunney. And I think that's the measuring stick. And that's what Poles did, bringing guys to create competition to get the best out of, of those who you have. Well, my Notre Dame fandom wants me to really pull for Cole Komet and want more from him. But he he's just not looking like a prototypical today tight end. Like he's a decade off almost like he would have been special in the nineties <laughs> or the early two thousands, but not in the 2023s. Right. Um, Tunyon. I do like that. I, I, I love when you can take something away from green Bay and bring it to Chicago. It's much better on this side of the cheddar curtain. So he's joining the uh, right side of the rivalry. Um, but listen, the tight end room got better. The wide receiver room got better. The offensive line gets better. That's all good things for Justin Fields. It's the right question, and I'm not sure yet. Will the Celtics stave off the heat in Game 5 tonight? Did they just have a hot shooting night, or is there a chance they could stretch this thing out and not become the first NBA team in 150 attempts to win the conference championship after being down zero games to three? You know, I'm a big Jimmy Butler critic. I have been for years, but I've, 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 I've admitted and I've come to grips with the fact that it's hard to hate on a guy that does everything I love. And that is, you know, performing with your back against the wall, taking a lesser team, to a, to a height that you've never seen before. And so I don't necessarily think that um, Miami will close out uh, today because I do think the Celtics are just a good team. But I, I, I think Jimmy needs more of a chip on his shoulder, and that might come you know, with them uh, holding on to a 3-2 lead. So I think they'll close it out in game six. Uh, but I, 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 I just I cannot believe what Jimmy Butler is doing with the Miami Heat. It's like Jimmy and the guys. And, he, and he's doing it at such a high level. It is really impressive. And again, I, I, I want to hate on him because of everything. But it's again, he makes it extremely difficult to do so when he's performing at this level. I want a game seven. I mean, what in the world is the NBA going to do if this ends tonight and they have a full week off? They are going to lose all momentum. If the Celtics should win the series, only they're not going to be able to. So they're going to lose this series, whether it's tonight or back in Miami. And I, I'm kind of amused hearing people talk about the different types of ways that uh, that the, the, who's the pressures on who they're facing elimination games. Okay. <laughs> and they've lost every game five they played at home in the playoffs. So hopefully it ends tonight because I'm with you on Jimmy. Awesome story. We'll have to get into it. All right. We